So in this unit, we're going to look into the costs of attacks. So, well, how did McLeese figure out that the parameters he's chosen, the n equals 1024, um, k equals 524, and t equals 50, how could you figure out that that would cost 2 to the 60 or 2 to the 64 for an attacker to break it? So we're going to look into, well, what's called information set decoding attacks next, but let's first see how one could brute force such an attack. So we're looking at the uh, setup for the Niederreiter system. So we're giving the public key, the parity check matrix, and we're giving a syndrome, and we know that the syndrome S comes from multiplying the parity check matrix by some error vector, where this error vector has weight exactly T. So T is a parameter of the crypto system, K is a public key, so everybody knows those, and also Eve knows this as well. And so Eve could be trying out how to find this E. And the brute force approach would be to pick basically columns at random, well, T columns, and test whether those sum up to the syndrome S. And while well, we know it's T columns, so we have N columns to choose from. So this will only have one good one. So to find this one, you would typically need to choose N choose T sums of T columns. Of course, you can get lucky earlier, you can get lucky later, but this is um, the average cost of this brute force attack. Now, doing each times t columns, you can uh, optimize better. For instance, if you hold the first t minus one positions and then just modify the teeth position, then it's well some initial cost and then plus one column addition. And similarly, the next time you swap in this one with something else, making sure that you're not testing the same one again. And so you can get the costs down to basically n choose t additions of just one column and some initial work. So that is the baseline of attacks. But already um, before code-based crypto came around, we had some better algorithms. So this goes back to 1962 and it's called information set decoding. So Pranch has made this algorithm purely in the setting of coding theory to analyze um, how to decode random codes. So when you remember the unit where I showed how to turn syndrome decoding into regular decoding, and how to use regular decoding if you have a syndrome, then one way to turn the syndrome into an input to regular decoder was to expand the syndrome by putting zeros in the front and then, well, there it was called X, it's now called S for the syndrome. Um, that would be a word, well, this X would be a word having the S in the last part, which then would give the syndrome S. Now, if the syndrome has weight just t, then that would be the result we're looking for. So taking um, that, well, let's put k into systematic form. So systematic form, remember, that means we're putting in an identity matrix in the last n minus k positions, and in the first k positions, well, we have whatever is left. And this doesn't always work. Um, so it might be that this part, this last part, is not linear independent, um, but Pranch's algorithm is actually going to be doing a permutation over all kinds of positions there, and each time that it is a valid um, n minus k by n minus k matrix, he computes an identity matrix there. So let's take one of those permutations where it actually works, and let's assume that our s is already matching that. So if then s for this permutation has weight t then, well, it's exactly those dots around the diagonal which get hit. So if you put this uh, expanded vector, um, all zeros followed by the S, well, you multiply this vector by the matrix, and then wherever the positions are, you see the lines in the matrix, it grabs that column, but that column just has ones on the diagonal. And so in that case, you're getting that the syndrome has by t exactly in those positions. Now, what Pratt is doing is he permutes this public key matrix k, brings it to systematic form. Well, if it works, else start over. And then, well, let's remember what we used for that. So the permutation of the columns is some permutation matrix p, and then there is some invertible matrix u that produces the systematic form. 
So that means that k prime is actually to equal to u times k times p. What does it do for the um, syndrome? The permutation doesn't change the syndrome because if it's the same positions being added, but the u part does change the syndrome. So the syndrome is updated to u times the old syndrome. So that's some, some s prime. And now if the weight of this u times s is t, well, then we're in the situation that I've just described, and we're getting that an error vector for this permuted matrix that produces this updated syndrome is all zeros followed by this u times s. Okay, now this was not the original matrix, so what would this matrix do on the original error vector? Well, the error vector is this vertical thing, and that actually cares about the permutation part. So the E prime that we have computed here is E, the original E, permuted by the matrix P. So to get to the original E, we have to apply the inverse of P, and then that one actually is the original E. All right, so if this happens, then we win, we're lucky, and else we would return to one, the first step and re-randomize. Now, when does this work? This works if we have found a split so that all the errors are in the identity part and none of the errors is in the X part. Okay, we have N columns. There are N minus K of those in the identity part and K in the X part. And so it works if our split that we did there is such that all T positions are in this N minus K part. So the probability is, well, N minus K choose T divided by N choose K, uh, T. Or if you look at the cost, well, we always have to do the inverse of the probability on average. So the cost is N choose T over N minus K choose T. And each time we have to do these matrix operations. So each time, well, we have that many permutations, and each time we have to see what the Gaussian relations works. And if so, the last part is pretty fast. So updating S to U times S and checking the weight doesn't really cost much. And so the biggest cost is reading the matrix operations. And so, well, knowing that the um, last part is not um, linear independent, we won't know until we have gotten fairly far down. So it's basically that many times a matrix operation. All right, so this was the algorithms that um, MacLeese knew, so he knew the uh, French algorithm when he had his parameters. And it's a fairly simple algorithm. Um, when you think through it, it's not that bad. And if this doesn't make sense, I really recommend to stop the video now and go back through the uh, explanation, because the next few algorithms are improvements on this basic information set decoding. So the next algorithm is due to Lee and Brickell, who said, well, we would like to improve our probability having this large part n minus of, of k uh, positions in the x part where there is no error allowed. Remember that for the MacLeese case, k is about half of n. And so the um, restriction that none of the errors is allowed there is pretty severe. So what Lee and Brickell are saying is, well, if we allow a few errors in this part, so we're doing the same setup as with uh, French, so we're also doing a permutation, we bring it to systematic form, and we're updating our S. So S is now this S. Well, there's this K prime, there's an updated S prime, and there's an updated E prime. And then we're hoping that the um, S prime has the low weight, except for, well, Maybe it's not S prime itself. Maybe there is some extra part from the X part. So maybe these two blue columns from the X part are also non-zero positions. So we now have three positions in the black part and two positions, the blue part and the X. So what this would do is we're adding these two columns of X to this S prime and I'm using some annotation there, so we're gonna pick exactly p columns in the x part, 
and recalling the vector that this gives, so the sum of these p columns, we call that, um, well, the, the binary vector, the one which has just p entries, that's the boldface p, and then that times x is, well, the sum that gets added to s. So that's x times p. And what we want is that this updated s plus the x times p has weight exactly t minus p. Because the t minus p, well, p we've already allocated for the two blue columns, and then t minus p would be in the right-hand side. And then we can perform exactly what we did before. So we put the p part now instead of all the zeros, and then we're having x plus x times p. And so it should actually be consistent. So this s is the u times s or the s prime up there. I'll fix this on the slides. And well, if this works, same as in French, we update, uh, we output the unfamiliar version, and else we go back. But in this case, we have two possibilities for going back. And we typically would go back to choosing a different set of two blue columns. So we're picking a different, well, called P different columns. And then we're updating S by adding those columns, so by adding X times P. So we have a new chance in the inner loop. And then every once in a while we have an outer loop where we re-randomize the matrix. So if we um, go through all the combinations in the blue part, so we're checking any p combinations of those k vectors, then we're guaranteed to find, well, to succeed with any of the uh, error patterns where we now have t minus p in the identity part and p of them in the x part. So that means that the um, the big part, the outer loop, uh, works, well, probability, so inverse again the number of counts. So we have t, uh, n choose t for the general probability of how many possible assignments there are. And then on the inside, well, we're allowing p combinations of the k in the x part and t minus p out of n minus k in the black part. Now, each of those will cost the matrix operation. And then on the inner loop, where we're updating the choice of p, um, that is k choose p of the column additions. So that is similar to the brute force part. Um, at first, it looks like you're having each time you have to add p columns, but you can actually um, improve that to just add one column, basically. All right, so that's Lee and Brickell. And then Leon said, well, let's do the same, but you know, we can do some earlier aborts. When we, when we look at this s plus x times p, that is typically not the right value. And typically, if you're not having the right value, it's pretty random. So each of those positions out of the, well, the height is n minus k, each of those will be um, set to one on average. So that means we could actually stop much earlier. And so what Leon says, well, let's only check a small subset of those. We should choose a subset randomly. So this is the, the green lines in the picture. And uh, yes, it should be k minus, uh, n minus k over 2, or k over 2, because that's what the weight is of what the height of the matrix is. Um, so the idea is we're checking on these green positions. Let's call this well, L positions there. And we're just looking at the sub-matrix of x, which is identified by the screen lines. You could think of it as the top L lines, but then you're missing the randomization. So that's, well, we're looking at those lines. And then Leon says, in order to enforce that S plus XP has a low weight, we insist on those positions to be all zero. So he again does the permutation, everything like black and branch. Then he does the inner loop, similar to Lee and Brickell, but instead of computing the full length of S times XP, he's only computing it on the green lines first. So he's only computing on the subset Z. So he's computing for each of those choices, he's computing X sub Z times P. If the syndrome plus this vector on those positions is zero, then he continues and else he just goes back to another choice. Now, of course, it could be that he has found exactly the right permutation 
except for, well, it's not zero on those positions. So you shouldn't choose your L too large because then you're too likely to get any of those. But you also shouldn't choose it too small because then you don't gain much. If it's just one position, well, it's 0-50% of the time anyway. And so you would be having too many of the more expensive computations. So there's a lot of uh, optimizations in the parameters going on. But the idea is, well, pick some random numbers, uh, random rows there, compute on those. And then for those where it is zero, you do the pull computation like in the Brickell. So there you check that you're getting weight t minus p, and then you expand the part, uh, and else you go back to, well, a new choice of p. And eventually, once you have done all of those, or if you choose a bit fewer, um, then you're going back to re-randomizing the matrix. So there's a small loss in success because, well, you might hit something with the green lines, which for this permutation would be allowed to be one. But, well, what we normally do is we actually pick different sets Z. So we're doing, for the split, we're doing one set Z and we're doing another set Z. And so um, we eventually will get the right one. And the final idea, which I'm going to explain in detail, is Stern's attack, which includes the um, idea of having a collision search in the first part. So it's the same as Leon and Lieber Cal and Prange, um, except for that he's now saying, well, the, the first part there, where you're looking at, well, in that notation was P columns, that is now known as, well, two P columns, got it slightly redefined what p means, um, we can speed this up by, instead of searching for something to be zero, we're searching for something to match, because, well, if you're computing mod two, then if they match, they will add up to zero. And so Stern says, well, let's split this into two parts, x and y, pre-compute all the combinations on x, but now for p, which is, well, half the size of the previous p, and then for the B part, so the X gets split into an X and Y, and the B and the A are the selected columns. Uh, we're then doing a collision search for the X plus the X part selected by uh, the Z part selected by the red columns and seeing whether it matches on the blue part. And so now if you find something with a redefined P, so it's T minus 2P, then you can expand and else you move on. But with the collision search, you're slightly getting better on the binomial coefficients. So it does actually give an improvement, even though it looks like it's, it's a rather small thing, but having um, k shoes p or k shoes 2p is sl uh, slightly smaller than k shoes p times k shoes p. And then of course you minimize, uh, you're optimizing this for the p, the l, and how many subsets of a to keep to minimize the overall work. So we've actually done that um, in 2008, and I have some uh, computation numbers later, but let's first, oh, actually here. Um, so for that one, we attacked the original parameters for MACLEs. So this was supposed to be 2 to the 60 secure, um, and uh, spoiler alert, we took something very, very close to 2 to the 60. So we took 2 to the 58 CPU cycles, and a CPU cycle can actually do multiple operations. So this is, pretty good confirmation that MacLeese was right in how he shows the parameters and we put a lot of optimization in there. So we used all the cheap updates that I mentioned. Um, we optimized the frequency for when you update the permutations and so on. We um, asked a few friends, so we had 200 computers, uh, roughly 300 cores, and well, not everybody was on there for the full 90 days that we ran this. Um, so in, in total, this was about 8,000 core days. And at some point, uh, we got an email from our friends from Ireland. You know, there's the uh, proverbial luck of the Irish, who said, well, um, sorry for joining late. Um, we, we're just doing some runs, and it seems that it has already stopped. Does this mean anything? And it meant that, um, well, they had actually found the um, secret that we were looking for. So it might look like, well, if it's a high-end computing center, then of course they would be the lucky ones. But they got disproportionately lucky in having just the right starting vectors. Anyway, so don't use the original parameters. I mean, they are as good as they were supposed to be, 
but that is not good enough against a professor with a few friends. I've also an overview of where the um, errors are allowed to be. So for the brute force attack, well, there is no restriction on where the errors are, but all the other methods we've seen do this permutation of the columns and succeed if you have the right pattern. So French succeeds if all the errors are in this n minus k part and nothing is in the k part. And then Lee and Brickell allow uh, already p errors in the k part and t minus p in the n minus k part in the identity matrix. And then Leon introduces this extra condition of these green lines. And these green lines, when you when you think through how they what they actually mean, that is a restriction on the n minus k part, saying in those positions you must have a zero. Now to match the picture, this would be taking this t minus p and putting uh, L green lines there. So I'm currently doing what I said in the before. Well, you shouldn't put them in the first block, but it's easy to draw it if it happens in the first block. So Leon succeeds if there's no error in those L positions, and then you can have P errors before and T minus P errors after. And then Stern does the collision search, which splits this, well, calls it P now, 2P, and splits this into two parts. We did another one um, together with Christiane Peters and Dan Bernstein, uh, where we said, okay, well, the zero part is getting kind of restrictive there, so we allow to have some collisions there. Uh, we call this ball collision decoding. There are also two other versions of it um, which have different optimizations and didn't even notice that there was an exponential speed up. And then this idea was taken further so this multi-level collision search, so we have the, the collisions on the P part, we have the collisions on the Q part, and so my Moira and Tomei, and, and after that Becker, Ju, my and Maura, Moira, they refined this even further. All right, so I've shown you a few of the algorithms. Here is just a, a big splash of how many people have worked on this. So Pranch is before code-based crypto started, everything else afterwards are attacks uh, using code-based crypto as their motivation, so not just uh, how to decode random codes, but they're actually saying how could you break the McAleese or Niederreiter system. Some of those uh, cover quantum algorithms, that is a topic for our next talk, but you can see that there's a quite a bit of attention on this. So how can you run away from these attacks? Well, the obvious thing is you choose larger parameters. So increasing n means increasing the um, size of the fine field that you're working with. So remember that n was upper bounded by 2 to the m, so your m has to go up for working this. So for the original MacLeese parameters, he was using 10. You can use 13 and you'll be fine. My l was not necessarily a power of 2, so the, the length n could be all the way to 2 to the m, but we're getting a higher, well, we're getting more randomness by having n slightly larger, and it improves the size of the public key because, well, n details how long the words are. And then there's a thing called list decoding, which means, well, we assume that there is maybe the minimum distance is a bit larger, or even if there are two code words within distance t, we can figure out exactly which is the correct one because we have the CCA secure security. So there's an extra tag telling us, well, this is the correct one, this is the incorrect one, or both of them are incorrect and you're under attack. Now, what do all these attacks mean in practice? So I said the 1978 McLeese uh, system that they shows the that he shows the parameters to be secure against, against branch. And all of these attacks are exponential. Now the exponential in the length, so there's a parameter L, well, sorry, parameter lambda, and since we're looking at matrices, we always have something coming in with lambda squared. But if you want to achieve 2 to the lambda security against branch attack, then your key size grows with some constancy 0 plus little of 1 times lambda squared. So lambda squared comes because it's a square matrix. Or roughly square, right? It's a two-dimensional object. And then there's a, a lower term log of lambda squared. And so for branch, this constancy 0 for binary gopper codes is 0 0.74188606694. Fast forwarding till 2021, um, today's 
Medley system, while we still have uh, the same kind of exponential growth, so we have uh, sorry, same exponential security, and so same um, c0 times lambda squared and so on for the key size, um, and the c0 for today after all of these attacks is oh, 0 0.74188. Well, that all matches. So the main parameter hasn't changed despite a full page um, of attack systems. What has changed in this is all in the little o of 1, and of course uh, this is the main part, so you do see speedups in practice, you have to choose your parameters larger, well, once um, cryptos, uh, computers are much bigger, so 2 to the 60, which seemed huge in 1978, is no longer that huge, but the security has held up really, really well, um, so it's it's the most stable crypto system that we have. When you look at the RSA estimates from about the same time, they were much more optimistic about the security or pessimistic for the attacker. So Copy's crypto is kind of the most boring crypto that we have. However, this only holds for Gopher codes. If you have other codes, then there can be much more exciting work. I mean, I mentioned there were quite a few corpses on the way that people in Coding 3 said, hey, look, I have my favorite code. Uh, can't we use that one as well? And that is where things normally went wrong. For copper codes, we don't know any way faster than these generic attacks to break them.